questions. This is the time for discourse. Um, we have you know, an expert in the field here. Hopefully, we'll take advantage of it. Alan E. Garfield is a professor at law at Delaware Law School. He received his Bachelor's of Arts, magna cum laude, from Brandeis University and his Juris Doctorate from UCLA School of Law, where he was a member of the UCLA Law Review and the Order of the Coif. Prior to joining the Widener faculty, Professor Garfield worked for three years in the litigation department of Wheel, Gottschers, and Mangs in New York City. He is licensed to practice in California and New York. Professor Garfield has been honored for his scholarship and teaching. He received the Douglas E. Ray Excellence in Faculty Scholarship Award in 2016, 2006 and 2015, and the Outstanding Faculty Award in 2004. He served as the H. Albert Young Fellow in Constitutional Law from 2005 to 2007, and was a distinguished professor from 2011 to 2014. Professor Garfield has also been a visiting professor at American University's Washington College of Law and Bryn Mawr College and an adjunct professor at Drexel University School of Law. Professor Garfield writes and teaches in the areas of constitutional law, copyright, and contracts. His scholarship has appeared in numerous journals, including the Columbia Law Review Sidebar, the Cornell Law Review, and the Washington University Law Review. He has also published op-eds in the Philadelphia Inquirer in the Wilmington News Journal, including since 2009, a monthly column in the new News Journal on the Supreme Court. The column Bench Press received the Delaware Press's Association's first award for a personal opinion column in 2012, 2013, 2014, 15, and 2017, and the first place award for a personal opinion column in a national competition sponsored by the National Federation of Press Women in 2012. Professor Garfield is the founder and coordinator of the First State Celebrates Constitution Day, a program run in collaboration with the news journal editors since 2006. He, has also, he also founded and is the current administrator of the Delaware Law School Patent Pro Bono Program. Professor Garfield is a past chair of the Association of American Law Schools section on mass communication law. He has also served on the board of directors of the Delaware ACLU since 2006 and was the board president from 2015 to 2017. So as you can see, we have quite the expert here with us today and I hope you enjoy the rest of our time together. Do I need to use this or? Let me do this. Nope. Is this gonna be? Okay, can you all hear me? Please let me know if you can't. I'm not sure where to stand in this kind of crowd, but I guess I'll stand in the middle. So this is a fantastic turnout for Constitution Day, right? Does anybody know which day was Constitution Day? It was last Sunday, September 17th. Do you know what that day marks? <coughs> well, something about the Constitution. You're getting warm there. It is the day September 17th in 1787 where the framers signed the Constitution in Philadelphia. You know, 20 miles from here, right? Okay? So it's a wonderful time to step back for a minute and reflect on the meaning of the Constitution and the values embodied in it. So I'm thrilled to have you here. So let's get right down to business, shall we? Okay. So from what I understand, Congratulations are in order. Okay, that I've been told that all of you have been just been appointed to the Supreme Court of the United States. Okay? Sound good? Okay. And how long does that how long does that job last, by the way? Life. What? For life. For life. Okay? Pretty good, huh? For life. The only way to kick you off is to impeach you. No Supreme Court judge has been successfully impeached. Some lower court judges have. They've wanted to impeach some. So you've got a job for life. All right? The salary, I think, is like over $200,000. The Constitution doesn't allow Congress to lower your salary. They could increase it. Okay? You're going to have four really smart law clerks to help you out. They don't have oral arguments in the summer, so you could go to your mountain retreat or your, or your beach Resort, sound good? How many of you like the job so far? Okay, but there is a downside, okay? The downside is you're gonna have to have responsibility for interpreting the Constitution. That's not all you do, okay? And in doing that, there are gonna be people who are gonna be mad with the way you decided cases. They're gonna be like, who, who do you think you are, right? What are the first three words of the Constitution? 
What? We the people, right? Isn't the whole idea about popular sovereignty, we the people are the sovereigns or something, right? And we elect representatives who enact our, our values into the law. How many people are on the Supreme Court? Nine. Nine. What's, what do you need for a majority? Five. Five. So what if 95% of Americans say we can't stand flag burning. We want those guys going to jail. And then five of you say, ah, sorry, you can't do it. It violates the First Amendment. <laughs> Who are you to override them? What if 95% of the country says, we think there should be limits on corporate expenditures, on political campaigns. And five of you say, sorry, can't do it. Violates the First Amendment, right? Who are you to do that? What gives you the right to, in a country, in a constitution that says, we the people, to override everyone? What's, you gonna, what's gonna be your response to them? I mean, probably you're gonna say, you're just doing what? You're just following what? The Constitution. the Constitution, right? Hey, don't blame me. I'm just doing what the Constitution says. Well, let's see how well that works out, okay? The take the First Amendment, okay? And the core provision, it also has the religion clause as establishment and free exercise and peaceably assemble and the press clause and the petition clause, but this is the core that we're talking about today. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, okay? Do you think all you're doing is just, I'm just doing what the Constitution says. If you're just doing what the Constitution says, does that mean that if you criticize Governor Christie of New Jersey, New Jersey can pass a law and says anybody who criticizes the governor goes to jail for five years. Does the First Amendment apply to that? Not if you're just doing what it says, okay? Because it just seems to apply to who? Federal government. The, the federal government and maybe even just Congress, okay? But when you go to law school, you ultimately discover, you know, through the magic of judicial interpretation, it applies to governments, both the federal government, state, local government, to Rowan University, to public universities, okay? So. Uh, so it really has come to mean Congress shall make no law, okay? Abridging the freedom of speech. Speech. Well, I think you know what speech is, right? Speech is like oral words or written words. But how many of you think that conduct that communicates a message should be speech, like burning a flag at a protest or wearing an armband? How many think that should be speech too? Most of you think it shouldn't. Most of you don't want to take a position. You just want to take the money on the job and not make decisions. How many think that's speech? Anybody think it's not? Why is it not speech? Expression. It's expression? Well, if it's expression, is an expression a kind of speech? It's a form of speech, but I wouldn't call it speech. You wouldn't call it, would it not be protected by the First Amendment? You know, burning flags, wearing armbands, silent vigils, any of that stuff's not protected? No, literally, it's a literal interpretation. Oh, okay. Well, that's what the court said. Conduct that's expressive could be speech too, but you gotta, like you said, you can't really tell from the text. It doesn't tell you that much. And by the way, when Timothy McVeigh blew up a building, in, a federal building in Oklahoma City, was that a community act? Did he communicate a message? I would think everybody understood the message he's giving. Is that speech too? How do you distinguish burning a flag from burning a building? And not only that, look at this. It says Congress shall make no law. How many of you guys know what the meaning of no is? Right? I mean, toddlers don't. But you guys do. How many of you want to interpret the First Amendment to say no law means no law? Right? Isn't that obvious? But if you interpret the First Amendment that way, then you can't regulate perjury. That's speech. False advertising. That's speech. 
putting a billboard on top of your suburban house. That speech. I mean, the truth of the matter is, the government regulates speech all the time. And the trick in First Amendment jurisprudence is figuring out which abridgments of speech are unconstitutional and which are not. But when you say, I'm just doing what the Constitution says, do you think that really answers that question? I don't think so. And you could say, no, no, no. Well, if that doesn't do it, I'm just doing what the framer said. That's always a good one to do. Uh, and in fact, Betsy Ross was just in the hall. We could call her in, ask what they were thinking. Right? But what does that even mean? We'll just do what the framers said. The, the was the First Amendment in the original Constitution? How do you know? Because it came like as a bargaining chip for them just to pass it. It came afterwards. Exactly. When they were trying to ratify it, people said there should be a Bill of Rights or whatever. But, and it obviously wasn't in the original because it is an amendment. Well, as an amendment, that means it had to go through two-thirds of both houses of Congress and three-quarters of the states that were around that time had to ratify it. Who's in ten of all those people get counts? Is the one who drafted the provision, the people who voted in Congress, the ratified? And the truth is, there's very little evidence of what they intended. And my guess is they never really thought of issues like virtual child pornography and, uh, you know, and, and campaign contributions by multinational corporations, right? So the thing is, you're stuck. You got this good job, but you are going to have to decide which abridgments of speech are unconstitutional and which are not. You got that? You ready to do that? Okay. Now I'm going to make up a wild hypothetical, just right here in front of you, on the spot. Let me just think for one second of one. Okay, ready? Imagine Charlottesville, Virginia, okay, and a white supremacist group comes to Charlottesville, Virginia, and says, we'd like to have a march in your town. You got it? And the city council says, well, you know what? Our town believes in inclusivity. We're committed to tolerance. We want all members of our community to feel welcome. And we have a rule in our town, we have a city ordinance that says no one could get a, a, a permit for an event where they are going to communicate hateful ideas towards any group of people based on race, national origin, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation. So we can't give you a permit. Got it? And the white supremacist group says, that's it, we're suing. And they sue, saying this violates our freedom of speech. And it comes all the way up to you, the United States Supreme Court. And you have to decide this question. Is hate speech, speech that demeans a group of people based on race, religion, you know, whatever, should be protected by the First Amendment. And that if the government doesn't give you a permit to communicate even hate speech, it's violating your freedom of speech. What do you think? Should hate speech be protected or not? Now, there's a number of arguments you could make to say it shouldn't. People like to talk about the marketplace of ideas, right? Justice Holmes talked about it, and Milton talked about it, and John Stuart Mill talked about it. And it's, the idea is, rather than let the government decide what ideas could be expressed, we let all the ideas into the marketplace of ideas. Now that certainly makes sense if we're like talking about should we have socialized medicine or a single payer or Obamacare. We don't want the government saying you can't talk about socialized medicine. That's okay if we're talking about the war in Afghanistan. You know, people have to say, I don't think the war is a good idea. Others say, I think it is a good idea, right? Don't you think people should have the freedom to express their opinions? But can't we all agree hate speech 
is simply not a good idea. And since it's a bad idea, don't you at the court think that we should simply declare hate speech is one idea that's not protected by the First Amendment. And therefore, Charlottesville was free to say you can't have a parade. How many think that's how you decide the case? You just say hate speech is not protected. Not many. Why? Why do the rest of you think hate speech should be protected as freedom of speech? Hmm? Why? Any inkling? Yes, Trevor. Pretty good, huh? <laughs> We should go about it in a method that states the uh, the reasoning behind it. Like, no amendment should go against the rights of American citizens. Something like that, where you provide a uh, a good enough reason that states, you know, this is wrong and this is why it's wrong and this is why we can't have. It. So you think if the government could set forth a compelling reason? why hate speech shouldn't be protected, that you, and you as a judge are convinced by that, you'd say, yeah, I agree. It's not protected. As long as there's a good enough reason and it is something to sway five out of... Do you think it's a... Yeah, well, do you, would you, you're the judge, it's not me. You're making the money. Is to say hate speech is a bad idea? It leads to discrimination, even violence? Is that good enough for you to say it's not protected? Yeah. Yeah. And it opens up like a slippery slope. So like if we say, I, you know, we, I, well, I can speak for myself. I obviously don't adhere to like white supremacy. I think it's a terrible idea. Right. But someone else may have the right to believe in that. But who's to say 10 years down the line, maybe something I believe in may be considered hate speech. And the government may limit me from expressing those views. OK. Did you hear that, folks? Let me run with that for a second, OK? So one argument against the court getting in the business of saying, we're going to decide which ideas are good enough to be protected and which are not. You know, which ones have a compelling enough reason to say, nah, they don't get admitted into the marketplace of ideas. One argument is once the court starts carving out exceptions, first of all, who are they to do that? Who are nine people to make that decision for the rest of the country? Of course, you'd still need laws to ban that stuff. But who are they to say, yeah, that, you got, the government's free to ban that? But even if you think they should, once you start carving exceptions, just as you pointed out, you never know how in the future it's going to be applied, right? I mean, if they start carving away neo-Nazis and white supremacists, you know, because we made an exception to the First Amendment, I'm like, I'm OK with that. Right? But it could be there'll be some conservative community in the South where a group of people want to have a Black Lives rally. And they say Black Lives diminishes white lives. It's hate speech. Right? The famous case that you always talk about in constitutional law is when neo Nazis want to march in Skokie, Illinois, which had a big Jewish population, including a lot of Holocaust survivors. You can imagine how offensive that would be, right? Uh, and the court ultimately said you can't stop them. But, you know, even in that context, and I'm Jewish, you might say, I'd like to have an exception for the Nazis, right? Ten years down the road, there might be a large community that says, you can't have an Israeli Independence Day celebration because that's hate speech towards Palestinians, right? Are you allowed to say, have a rally against same-sex marriage, or is that hate speech towards gays and lesbians? You get the idea? So typically, the First Amendment is a calculated decision to, in effect, the way the court has treated it. In saying, we've got a choice here. On the one hand, we could say there's some bad ideas out there. We're going to put our trust in the government to decide which of those bad ideas and allow them to ban them and punish them. 
The other choice is to say, we're not, we're too afraid. We don't want to give Big Brother government the power to decide what ideas we can hear or express. Our preference is to say, let all the ideas into the marketplace of idea, even the ideas we hate. Let them all in and trust the people to hopefully choose the good ideas, right? And not the bad ideas. Is there any guarantee that the people will do that? I mean, Milton, John Milton, the philosopher said, you know, if truth and falsehood grapple, truth always wins. Do you believe that? I mean, not necessarily, right? Uh, you know, we had a liberal democracy in Weimar Germany that led to, you know, Hitler eventually being appointed chancellor, right? If you go turn on your cable television and flip through the 250 channels, you can kind of get a sense of what ideas the American public values. You know, how many intelligence stations are there on the 250? So, all right, but let's go on, okay? Here's another argument. What if, but the, but, but the Charlottesville legislature polled the citizens of Charlottesville. 98% said, we find hate speech offensive, disgusting. And so the legislators, just being good representatives, they say, that's why we passed the law. We just passed the law because that is what the majority of people want and we're in a democracy. Now it comes up to you. Is that a good enough reason to say the law is okay? Because that's what the majority want. What's wrong with that? Any problem? No problem with that? Anybody have a problem with that? Yeah. I mean, that's the tyranny of the majority, right? right? And is one of the purposes for you as a judge to help protect minority rights from in dissenting voices from the tyranny of the majority. If it's just a matter of majority will, there'll be some community in the Bible Belt where some group wants to have a gay rights parade and they'll say, I'm sorry, 90% of us find this offensive. Then the next week, the Darwinist Society wants to have a parade celebrating Darwin's uh, birthday and they say, I'm, we find that offensive too. Do you really want to go down a rule that the majority gets to silence any ideas they find offensive? The court's like, we don't want to do that either. Okay, I'll get you one second. And let me point out to you, it's always nice to say, it sounds wonderful, where you know, we want to protect against the tyranny of the majority. Okay? But that, that's not always going to answer your questions when you're on the Supreme Court. Because, you know, think about we also have free exercise of religion in the First Amendment. Let's say there's a religious group and the religious practice is human sacrifice. Are you going to say we can't let the, the, the majority tyrannize them by subjecting them to murder laws? Then the next group wants to have female genital mutilation. Can we say the majority can't stop them because that's the tyranny of the majority? Actually, you know, constitutional law is always trying to strike that balance between majority will, which you expect to prevail in a democracy, and minority rights and finding that. It's not so easy to do. Uh, yes, okay, and then I'll get you. Yes. Expression and then violence against other people. Absolutely. I agree with that. Uh, but I'm making the point that even though we have freedom of religion, it can't be absolute. Just like speech probably can't be absolute. So if you're talking in front of an abortion clinic to an angry pro-life crowd that's all riled up, and you say abortion doctors are murderers, there's one right there. You want to protect that speech? Maybe even if it's just speech, you don't want to protect it, okay? I don't know. Do you want to protect, you know, instruction? There's a book, How to Be a Hitman, with detailed instructions for how to kill people. 
You want to protect that? It's just speech. But, okay, so go on. Here's another thought. What about this, though? I like this one. The government comes in and says, look, here's how it works. Hate, when hate speech ideas are communicated, it's going to influence how people think. It's inevitable. And it's going to lead some people to be hateful towards the disparaged groups and to discriminate against the disparaged groups, whether it's a minority group or if it's sexist speech, misogynist speech towards women, and maybe even engage in violence. So wouldn't you say that it's a compelling reason to say, you can't say this because it's going to influence people to do bad stuff? Is that a good enough reason to be able to say you can't say it? What do you think? Who said no? Yes? It is, but why worry about their agency? Let's not let them hear the bad ideas in the first place. Why do they need to hear bad ideas? Some people are gullible. Well, if you don't hear a bad idea and investigate it, then you're just stuck believing something because it's the only thing you've ever heard. And then That's true. We'll just tell them the good ideas. Uh, yes, I'll, let's do two. Uh, go ahead, and then you, Trevor. Yeah. Uh, would you go out and make these marches? And couldn't them, by expressing their views, inspire violence against themselves, them expressing that and violence against okay. them? You know what? Yes, I want to hold that point. That'll be my next point. OK? What did you want to say? Um, well, we're basing this off the, uh, the idea that there is a dry current of good and bad. OK. And you want to well, hypothetically say you want to silence all the bad. So yes. The only thing you can get out is good. But what one might consider good is far from what another might consider. Well, OK. Do we think the government should have the power to decide what's a good idea and what's bad? What's yeah. the truth and what's, do we want them or do we rather let it all come out and let the people decide? Yeah. Well, and think about it. If you say the government could ban anything that might lead people to do something bad, then they could probably ban all violent video games and all violent movies, right? Because that might influence some people to engage in violent behavior. They, why, why not say we could ban all media that depicts women you know, as objective sexual objects. Because that leads to discrimination towards women and treating them as sexual objects. Of course, if you do that, then you're banning half the television and movies and advertising that exist. There's not going to be anything with the violence and the sexual stuff to watch anymore. OK? Or do we say, you got to let it out. What should be the response to this speech we hate if we can't ban it? argument. It should be counter speech. It should be more speech to expose the falsity of the ideas. I mean, that's what the court usually says. You know, if somebody burns a flag, the response is to wave your flag. If the neo-Nazi, if 10 neo-Nazis march in Skokie, have a, have a counter march with 100,000 people. You got it? That's usually what the court says. Now, mind you, there's a lot of countries in Europe that do allow ban hate speech. Okay. There are some things President Trump said during his campaign that in Europe he could have gone to jail for. Okay. Do, you, do you think in those countries they don't have racial tensions because they ban hate speech? Do you think the ideas go away? Or might they still be there under the surface anyway? 
Could it actually be better to let it out? That's, what some, that's a theory we have. It's kind of the safety valve theory. It's better to let people you know, get vent their bad ideas. It might be make it less likely they'll act violent. Yeah, I don't know if that's true or not. And what about the fact, why can't we just say hate speech is going to be deeply emotionally troubling to the people being disparaged? What about those people? How do you like to be a Jew in Skokie if the neo-Nazis get to march? You know, how, how would you like, you know, to be in Charlottesville, be a minority group, you know, black or Jewish or whatever, while the white supremacist group feels awful? Why isn't that a compelling reason to say you can't publicly speak if it's going to cause some people tremendous emotional distress? What do you think? Is that a good enough reason to ban it? How about over here? Is that a good enough reason? Protect people from emotional distress? Hmm? Some other hands, folks. Yes. Emotional distress is like this is kind of like a weird thing because what you might find emotional distress, I might not find emotional distress. Even if we're in the same group, like let's say like for the LGBT community, a lot of people were upset when certain rallies were happening and stuff like that, but others were like, we can't let this make us feel insignificant. We have to fight back and you know take back the words that they use against us and use it for us. I mean, is this another one of these, just as you're saying, these kind of slippery slope things where, you know, in some religious community, they're going to say, we're emotional, we get emotional distress from having a gay rights parade, right? We get emotional distress from a Black Lives Matter, you know, because we think that somehow diminishes white lives. You know, I mean, you could imagine during when Martin Luther King Jr. was, you know, having marches in the South in the 50s and 60s, they'd say, the white community says, this is causing us emotional distress, go march somewhere else. Right? You want to go down that road? I don't think so. Let me go to your point. But what about this? You know Charlottesville, it's got the University of Virginia, there's a lot of liberal people around, that if, and put the guns aside, I'm going to talk about the guns. The gun thing happened because Virginia has a law that says you're allowed to open carry weapons, and they preempt, the state overrides any city laws to the contrary. The Constitution didn't require that. Boston, in the parade there, had, didn't allow people to bring sticks or any kind of weapon, bats, anything, no guns. But that was an issue there, okay? But let's put the guns aside. I'll talk about that. But Charlottesville just says, look, if these white supremacists march, there's going to be another counter demonstration of people who hate the white supremacist. And there's going to be a real danger of violence breaking out, don't you think? Isn't that a reason for Charlottesville to say, I'm sorry, you can't get a permit because we think your ideas are so unpopular, there's going to be a big counter demonstration and we're worried there might be violence. Is that a good enough reason? I keep seeing the same hands, but I know all of you have washed your hands today. So let's see them, those clean hands. What do you think? Is that enough reason to say you can't do it because we think the violence might break out? Any thoughts? Any, any problem with going down that road? Yes? Oh, good. The same people who decide what free speech is and what hate speech is could decide what's bad information and good information. But what about the, the risk that there might be violence because the two groups don't like each other? Yeah. Um, it, that could also be a risk because you could assume like what groups are violent. Um, uh, for example, you're you're assuming that this group is violent or that group, like if it were obviously like a black against white case. Um, you know, they could be seen as overcautious and prejudging a certain group of people. I mean, can the government in advance say, because you don't know what's going to happen, to say, we think this might happen, therefore we're banning it. And what's also the downside if you have a rule 
that any time a group wants to have a march, if another group is saying, we're going we're gonna to sh show up and be really mad, that you get to tell the marchers, sorry, you can't march because there's going to be an angry crowd. I mean, think about it. When Martin, there's a whole bunch of cases where Martin Luther King Jr. was having you know, these marches in the South, civil rights marches, and guess what happened every single time? On the other side of the street, you know what there was? A big crowd of angry white protesters. Do you think the southern city should have been able to say to Martin Luther King, I'm sorry, you can't march because those guys are angry? What's the problem with that, yeah? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, so let me pick up on that point. Do you see this? If you say we can stop anybody from marching because an angry crowd might protest in opposition from them, you've basically empowered the angry crowd. You've given them the power to decide whether this group can march. You've given them what we call a heckler's veto. Should, you know, should they have the power, if, if enough whites got mad in the South, does that mean Martin Luther King can't march? Or is the job of the government to protect the speaker f from the protesters? Is that the first order of business, yeah? Mm -hmm. So is that like a custom, or is it just something that? No, I. Th law, like a law. Well, I mean, in some sense, you might say they have an obligation, even under the First Amendment, to do that. But let me give you this hypo, picking up on that. So Charlottesville says, you know what? If you guys march here, I know there's going to be a big counter demonstration. We're going to have to have a lot of police presence, don't you think? I think it's going to cost us. A million bucks. So I'll tell you what, you can march and the cost of the permit is a million dollars. Is it okay for the government to do that? Why not? Do they got to subsidize this stuff? But don't you see it's the exact same heckler's veto? It'll, it, it means that any counter demonstration, if they're like, we're gonna, we're gonna come and counter and be really angry, you're gonna need a lot of police. That is enough to jack up the price, the police price, that it's going to make it impossible to get the permit. Martin Luther King, sorry, you can't march because unless you give us 10 million bucks because there's going to be angry people who are going to have to have police to protect you. You see the downside of that too? All right, now let me, hold on. Let me make a shift. Okay. I think you're starting to see why, as awful as this speech is, the court has actually said you're allowed to express these ideas. Not every country does that. We have basically said it's better to not have the, business, the government in the business of saying what ideas you can hear than to just let them out and hope people choose the good ideas and respond with counter speech. That's the route we've taken. So that's why they do have a right to march. Not to bring their guns, that's a different issue. But they have a right to express their ideas for better or worse. Now let me just change it up. Let's make it a high school, a public high school. And a kid wants to come to high school wearing a Confederate flag shirt. Now out in the world, could some crazy white supremacist fly a Confederate flag outside of his house, yes or no? Could they put a Confederate flag bumper sticker on their car? But do you think a kid could go to, a 10th grader could go to high school with a shirt that says, has the Confederate flag there? Is that different? Yes. How?
something and they said, you can't do that, we can uh, suspend all of you. And they said, what about my First Amendment? And they said, you gave up your right to speak. Is that fair? Well, that, that isn't right. In, the, in fact, there is a Supreme Court case, the landmark one, Tinker versus Des Moines. And the first line, and the famous line of the case is that teachers and students do not shed their First Amendment rights when they go through the schoolhouse gate. But even if that's true, should the balance nevertheless be different? Should there be different rules for what people could go do in the public, you know, in a park or on a street, than what kids could do in schools? I mean, could a kid come to school with a shirt that says, use the bathroom of your birth sex? Or could the school say, you can't do that? Can a kid come to school with a shirt that says, build the wall? Or a shirt that says, Trump supporters are deplorables? Or can a high school provincial say, I'm sorry, you take off that shirt, or you're suspended? What would you guys do? You're the high school principals. Yeah. I'd say if all of it doesn't like, violate a person's rights in education and mm -hmm. the teacher's right to teach. Is it enough if it like, bothers the kids? Yeah, it causes a, a disturbance in the classroom or in the school. Uh, so in fact, the court has this notion from the Tinker case that if materially disrupts, do you think those shirts materially disrupt? What? Why? Um, I mean, it makes people not concentrate on like the material that they're learning in class. Like if someone's learning something controversial, like when somebody's focusing on that, talking about that, it's really what they're focusing on. It could distract, because everybody's focusing on that. There was a case from Delaware where a girl wanted to go to school with her hair dyed pink. Could that be speech? Is that expressive? And does that disrupt? Probably everybody was talking about it. They actually, the school backed down when she was sued by the ACLU. You know, yeah, go ahead. Um, I guess in like public sphere such as school and work, uh, everyone of every, every background has the right to the same opportunities and success. And um, I guess uh, like hate speech or a shirt with hate speech on it would, would um, uh, it's like the equivalent to bullying, like her a pink hair, for example, isn't bullying anyone, but um, a hate speech shirt would be bullying. I mean, are schools different? Do schools have an obligation to make all their students feel safe? Do schools even have an obligation to teach values like be tolerant, right? Although, you know, in the school cases, this is the tension on the one hand, we want our schools to teach tolerance and inclusivity, right? On the other hand, the court says we don't want schools being bastions of totalitarianism where it's like they just tell the kids what they're supposed to think. I mean, there's public debates about same-sex marriage. You know, huge debates, you know, and presidential candidates and other people. Could you tell a kid he can't go to school with a shirt that has the line from the Bible, when a man lies with a man, it's an abomination? Or is that part of public discourse? Now, go ahead. I was just going to say, um, shirts with, like, hate crimes can create a violent situation for students in school. And it's different when you have it on your car, on your property, because it's your private property. That's your belongings. But when you're in school with other children with a huge diversity, mm -hmm. you know, it could create a lot of violence, especially depending on the community and the school you're attending. If you're in a more violent area, you know, now the administration needs to be more aware of what can continue to happen. But that's also true out in the public. If you're going to, you go to New York City, a very diverse city, and you want to have a white supremacist rally. Mm -hmm. But maybe schools are different. Maybe it's because the ages are different. How about... Well, let me, let me just switch it up for a second. How about college? Rowan University. Can you wear those shirts? What do you think? Can you wear the Confederate flag? Trump supporters are deplorable. You know, gay marriage is an abomination. What do you think? Or is that, you know, People, this is your school. You want to feel safe at school. 
Doesn't the school have an obligation? Now, let me just say this. The Supreme Court has made it clear that threats, personal threats, are not protected by the First Amendment. Okay? Speech, like the example I gave before the abortion clinic, like there's a doctor over there. Speech that's about to incite immediate violence is not protected by the First Amendment. Fighting words, a one-on-one -on -one personal insult that would make the person want to go, damn fighting words, boo, are not protected. But just walking around with a shirt doesn't do any of that stuff. Do you think people should be, be able to walk around this campus with shirts that have hateful ideas to many members of the community? Why? Do we have any obligation as a community to not make, and, and guess what? You know, the majority groups on campus, those aren't usually the messages people are walking around. They're usually walking around messages that make, you know, groups that have generally typically been disenfranchised. Who's in a community like this, don't we have to respect them? Yes, and then I'll get you guys, I haven't forgot. Go ahead. Well, let's say it doesn't incite violence. It doesn't. It's not going to incite violence. It's well, just if you, if you wear something that bothersome. You know, is a belief that will incite violence in anybody. I feel. Like let's say there's no evidence it's going to incite violence. It's just, you know, somebody walks around for the religious people. All right, somebody walks around. The Marx quote: "Religion is the opiate of the masses." That might bother some people. A fight might not break out about it. But is that OK? Is that like, this is the exchange of ideas. It's a university. Yeah. So what, what, if, I, uh, what if I change up the situation real quick, and you put um, people in a football stadium, and you have two big rivalries, right? Yeah. Yes. Does he, in the Cowboys jersey, go against any of their rights? No, but they're not going to appreciate it because he's wearing something that they don't like. Will it incite violence? In some situations, yeah, because people are just like that. Uh, I don't uh, think it should be a problem of whether or not you are promoting an idea that people don't like. I think it's an idea that people should stop being so incrimin I mean, uh, yeah, um, incriminating towards you because you are wearing something that you personally, in yourself, So you should be able to express it. And other people should just, you know, you walk around with the Hitler was right shirt. Ultimately, if you have something that you believe in your mind is true to you, yes. there should be no way anybody else can try to infringe on you. Same thing in high school, middle school. Yes. Well, you, guess what? There are. That's is how you dress. Communicative. Is that interfere with your free speech? Dress codes. There have been cases like that in the lower courts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And well, does that then go for everything? Does it go for the Hitler was right? Does it go for any of those things? Uh, do we on a college campus, on a high school? Yeah. Yeah. But 
Yeah. Right. I mean, in outside of school, outside of college, can people say those things, do you think? I mean, there's politicians running on campaigns, you know, about whether we should allow this or not, right? But in schools, is it different? You know, do, we, do kids have a right on college or high school or middle school or whatever, a transgender kid that I shouldn't have to put up with that. I shouldn't have to see that when I'm at school. I should feel safe at school. You could wear Nike and Adidas, uh, a Philly shirt, not a Cowboys. Any other thoughts? I, I just, one second, I don't know if you wanted to talk at all. I don't want to about Rowan or anything or? Yeah, you know, I think um, the points all you guys make when this comes to our office, if there was an issue, would be all points that we would consider. There is, you know, what lawyers say often, there is no right or wrong answer necessarily. We would grapple and go through the same analysis. A lot of what, um, you know, you guys can look up the policy, but a lot of what our analysis would end up on would be what the effect has on the college campus. If it's going to, like you're saying, if it's going to incite violence or we might even, you know, let it go. You're allowed to, we have a whole policy on if you want to have a demonstration tomorrow on some issues, you file an application if there's only 10 people or more, we let it go on and we monitor it. We send public safety there, like you said, um, to the best we feel our obligation. So the same thing, if someone comes to school with a shirt on and we do get a message that someone is, you know, an obsolete junk or is getting followed, that's going to be a different approach. So I can't give, a, you know, one answer all, but everything you're saying is wonderful and is what we would be And, and, and let me also make this point, okay? And that is, you know, maybe we should say hate speech is not protected, but you get into all those definitional problems and all the other problems we were talking about before. But if we allow it, okay, if we ultimately say under the First Amendment, our choice is to say, rather than let Big Brother decide what we could hear or say, We'd rather it come out and we're going to trust the people. People sometimes forget that implied with that freedom is a responsibility on the part of the users. That's you and me. Just because we have the right to say hateful things doesn't mean we need to do it. I mean, some people think, this is my First Amendment right. You know, I, it is your First Amendment right. That doesn't mean it's good to do. We also might have an obligation if people are espousing hateful things to respond to them with counter speech, like you said, right? To have counter rallies. Okay, I'll get you in one second. Okay, you know, just because people have a right to publish fake news doesn't mean we, the people, don't have responsibility if we want our democracy to succeed to educate ourselves, to seek out good sources of information, and to attend Constitution Day programs at our county campus, right? Yeah. I don't know if people are aware of this, but a week, your idea of counter, to hold a counter rally, mm -hmm. a week after Charlottesville in Boston, mm -hmm. there was a white supremacist rally that was allowed to go through, and there were like, um, you know, 50 white supremacists who showed up. 40,000 people showed up on the Boston Common and shouted so loudly not a single word of white supremacist speech was heard. Right, and, and, and in fact, right after Charlottesville, I think there was a shudder in the country of there was just going to be one of these rallies after another in city after city. And I think even with Boston, I think there was a similar response in San Francisco that people started to see the other side kind of drowning out, and maybe that's how we want it to work. And let me just say one other thing I said, I mentioned something about guns. Here's a trick question. What comes after the First Amendment? Huh? Right, the Second Amendment. 
the right to, which is the right to bear arms. Okay? Now, does the right to bear, does the Second Amendment right to bear arms include the right to a private individual right to possess a gun? Yes. Has that been true since 1791? Yes. Well, actually, the way it was interpreted up until like 2000 something was it was only a collective right to have a gun in connection with a state militia. It, in 2000, I don't know, three or four, something like that, for the first time, the Supreme Court said it also includes a private right. But the only thing the Supreme Court has said thus far is it is a right to possess a handgun at home for defense. Not a right to open carry, you know. Now, there have been lobbying in lots of states to have these open carry laws and other stuff. Virginia, where Charlottesville is, that's the headquarters in, I think, Fairfax of the NRA. Okay? And they do have a, an open carry law. But it's not because the Constitution, to this, at least at this point, requires it. And in Boston, which doesn't have that law, they had, you know, does it violate the First Amendment for the police to show up and, like, try and keep the angry crowds apart? They could do that. And they had rules. You can't bring guns, you can't bring sticks, you can't bring bats. And it ended up being a peaceful rally, largely. And instead, just, you know, the, the non-white supremacists were dwarfed. I mean, they dwarf the white supremacists. Um, okay, yes? Can I ask something uh, more general? Sure. Back to the uh, Charlottesville City Council. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're just not allowing a parade. What's to prevent Schmuckenheimer and a white sheep to go to a street corner and he himself espouse this putrid, racist bigotry, right? Right. But shouldn't they, as a uh, city government, be allowed to decide what parades or okay. groups can come together? Good. All right. Good. Let me take that. Part of okay. It? Yes. Let me. Let's. Okay. First of all. How many of you think a city could say, before you have to ha have a parade, you got to get a permit? You think cities have to be able to do that? I mean, clearly they have to, but otherwise you're going to have like 10 parades on Fifth Avenue in New York City, you know, in the middle of the day. It's going to be a disaster, right? And the court says that's fine. Okay. Can a city say, you got to have a permit to have a parade? And the, the, the mayor of the city, in her discretion, will decide who gets a permit. Is that OK? And sure enough, the Girl Scouts want to have a parade. Yeah, you could have a parade. OK, and the Little League group wants to have a parade. You could have a parade. And the White Supreme, no, you can't have a parade. Is that OK? I mean, the only problem is if you go to the South in the 1950s and Martin Luther King wants a permit, they say, no, nah, I don't think so. And the court will not allow you to use that kind of discretion. So the point is, they can have a permit requirement, but they can't use it to pick and choose what parades could come based on whether they like the ideas or not. Now, safety is an issue, but if they just say you can't parade because people are going to get angry at you, then Martin Luther King Jr. can't march in the South either, because he's going to get a violent reaction. So that's also a problem. Yes? Yeah. Mm hmm. Yes. Right. Well, OK. And, and you know what? I'll do this, and then I'll take, if there's any more questions, I'll take it, and then we'll call it a day, because you guys have all, those cookies are there. I don't want them to get stale, <laughs> unless you have anything else you want to say. So the, the only problem with that is the law, the rules tend to say there's got to be a danger of imminent 
violence. You know, the classic example, it's not incitement, but it's speech leading to immediate harm is falsely yelling fire in a crowded theater. If you could say just, you know, guess, well, I think this shirt, you know, the, you know, anti-gay marriage, that might lead to violence and this might lead to violence, then it's like you do whatever you want. You got carte blanche power. And I think that's the concern. So in any event, I'll just say this. One, if you have any questions about law school or my law school, I'm happy to stick around afterwards. If you have any questions about hate speech of the First Amendment, I'm happy to stick around afterwards. If you ever want to contact me, I'm Garfield at Delaware Law School. Garfield like the cat. So that, he's my cousin, uh, a much more famous cousin. And uh, that would be fine. But otherwise, I really appreciate you taking the time to celebrate Constitution Day, I think. It's, you know, you're serving your country well. All right, have a good time. Thank you. Thank you.